welcome to the ABG Interpretation and Fluid Electrolytes e-course. This is the first presentation in the Fluid Electrolyte series. So we will deal with the water hemostasis, how the human body which is composed 70% of water deals with the water. So as we all know the most important organ that gets affected once there is change in water level is the brain. Now brain is protected by what is called a blood brain barrier. So even though there is a blood brain barrier that prevents most of the problems that are occurring at the level of the blood to get transmitted into the brain but still if there is a gross change in the osmolarity of the fluids then there will be a change in the osmolarity inside the brain as well. Here we can see the blood brain barrier but then it can get affected because there are water channels that is the aquaporin 4 channels that we can see over here. These will affect the osmolarity of the brain cells as well resulting in change in brain function. So the two most important things that we come across are the hyperosmolar stress and the hypoosmolar stress. In a hyperosmolar stress that is a relative absence of water there will be increase of solutes around the cells resulting in the cell shrinkage. As the water goes out the size of the cell goes down. Similarly, the opposite thing happens in the hypoosmolar state because there are less solute in the environment of the brain, it tends to swell up as the water comes in. But then there are preventive mechanisms like chan electrolyte channels which transport the electrolytes into the cell and out of the cell thereby restoring the normal cell volume. So if the normal cell volume is not produced, then we will have some type of neurological symptoms or neurological damage in a patient. Now let's see how the water hemostasis is maintained so that the brain function is preserved because brain is the most important organ in the body. Any effect on the brain function will permanently cause problems to the organism. So body takes all steps so that these type of events are prevented. Now to maintain the water hemostasis the most important factor is thirst. Now these are the OVLT that is the organum vasculosum lamina terminalis the supraoptic nucleus these are the cells which have the TRPV which is a transient receptor potential vinyloid. These are basically cation channels. Now what happens is if there is a change in the electrolyte situation or the osmolarity around the cell as we had seen in the previous image, say for example there is a hyperosmolarity. This will result in the shrinkage of these cells thereby triggering the cation flow because into the cell through the TRPV receptors. This will depolarize the cell and result in release of vasopressin and thirst signals will be sent. Apart from this, the drying of the mucosa in the oral cavity and the nasal cavity can also give a sense of thirst and make the organism to drink more water. Now reverse will happen if there is hypoosmolarity which will inhibit the vasopressin release and thirst. So vasopressin release and thirst are the two mechanisms by which the body will try to conserve fluid. Thirst will help in the organism to take in more water thereby replenishing the lost store and the vasopressin will conserve the water that is already present in the body. So these are the two most important cells that is the OVLT and supraoptic nucleus. These regulate the thirst and vasopressin release. Now vasopressin release. It is synthesized as a pro-hormone in the magnocellular cell bodies of the paraventricular and the supraoptic nuclei of the posterior hypothalamus. 
and by binding to a carrier protein that is neurohypophysin, it is transported along the supraoptic hypophysial tract to the axonal terminalis of the magnocellular neurons in the posterior pituitary. So they are produced in the posterior hypothalamus and then transported to the posterior pituitary where they are secreted. Once there is a stimulation as we saw, we will get from the hyperosmolarity around the brain cells. So they are synthesized and storage takes place around 2 hours. They have a TF around 20 to 30 minutes and they are metabolized by vasopressinase which is present in liver and kidney. Now vasopressin receptors. Vasopressin acts on V1, 2, 3 and the oxytocin type receptors. V1 receptors are located in the vasculature, myometrium and the platelets. This is the receptor by which we use this drug for vasopressor function in septic shock. The V3 is in the pituitary and the receptors which we are concerned right now, that is the V2 receptors are along the distal tubule and the collecting ducts. The V2 receptor is a G protein coupled receptor with physiologic function that is mediated largely by the G protein Gs resulting in the activation of adrenal cyclase to increase the intracellular cyclic AMP. The mutation in this is responsible for X-linked nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Now as we see, if the osmolarity is high, then it will result in thirst and vasopressin release. Thirst will give a stimulus for drinking which will again inhibit the osmotic receptors. Now vasopressin release will act on the kidney thereby there will be water reabsorption which will go on to inhibit the osmolar stimulus. So this feedback loop is actually which is regulating the whole water hemostasis in the body. Now let's come to the kidney we saw how the brain is reacting to hyperosmolarity now that the vasopressin is released let's see how the kidney plays the role in conserving the water and preventing dehydration now the medulla of the kidney reaches up to four times the concentration of the surrounding interstitial fluid and it's like a concentration oasis with a, a pocket of hypertonic fluid within the deeply vascular organ unprotected by barrier epithelium. Now there are two very important receptors which we need to know which are present in the ascending limb that is the bumetanide sensitive sodium potassium chloride co-transporter and the thiazide sensitive sodium chloride co-transporter. The blocker for these transporters are usually used as diuretics. Now generating the medullary concentration is very important and it results on three important factors that is the hairline loop resulting in the solute and water exchange, the highly energy dependent ch channels that is the receptors that we saw which will transport the cations and last is the descending limb of water permeable and exiting sodium from the thin ascending limb creates a concentration gradient that pulls the water from the descending limb. And as the tubular fluid moves into the ascending limb, these transporters increase the gradient in the tubular fluid. Now, let's see how it works actually. This is the tubular structure. This is the vasa recta. Now, in the tubular structure, the descending limb is permeable to water. So, there is a lot of water loss which is occurring all along this segment. This segment is totally based on water loss. So as we go along, there is a concentration gradient gradually keeps on increasing. And there is a lot of solute accumulation which is going on in the medulla. Now this part of the tubule that is the ascending limb is totally impermeable to water. So no water can move in or out from this place. So in this place, we have these energy dependent channels which keep on pumping these electrolytes against a concentration gradient. Mind you, these are already a very highly concentrated zone inside the medulla. And even on that, these channels, the two channels that we know, that is the sodium potassium chloride and the sodium chloride channel, both pump these electrolytes into the medulla against a highly concentration gradient. This is a highly energy dependent process and this is one of the major factors resulting in a highly concentrated medulla. Now apart from that, 
as we already know there are four aquaporin channels these are specific channels for movement of water aquaporin channels are 1 2 3 and 4 the aquaporin 1 is predominantly present in the proximal convoluted tubule and the descending limb so what it does is it keeps on moving the water out from the tubule resulting in a concentrated solution over here now now this area is completely impermeable to water these are there are absolutely tight junctions which prevent any water from going inside now this can only be opened up by the presence of vasopressin now presence of vasopressin will further dilute or concentrate the urine based on the signals that we are getting if there is an increased vasopressin presence there will be further concentration of urine now to look at more closely this is the collecting ducts this is exactly where the vasopressin acts once the vasopressin acts on the vasopressin receptor there is increase in cyclic amp now this cyclic amp will result in an increase in the aquaporin 2 aquaporin 2 is the channel which is dependent totally on vasopressin presence and it is this channel which is going to reabsorb the water from the lumen now this will make the aquaporin 2 channel appear in the luminal side now the water will go in through these channels from the lumen into the cell and into the vessels aquaporin 4 channel is present irrespective in the basolateral regions of these cells irrespective of the vasopressin concentration vasopressin presence will result in an increased production of aquaporin 3 which will further increase the water reabsorption so it is the vasopressin presence which will further concentrate the urine by moving the water from the lumen into the blood vessel through the aquaporin 2 channels this is just a simplistic diagram the vasopressin attaches increase in cyclic amp resulting in increased aquaporin 2 concentrations so the water moves from the luminal side into the blood the aquaporin 3 and 4 are already present in the basolateral regions in absence of aqua vasopressin the aquaporin 2 receptor is reabsorbed and lysed so as the vasopressin concentration increases the water excretion drastically decreases resulting in conservation of urine thank you for your patience this is the basic of water hemostasis in the next class we will deal with how these disorders that is some disorder in this mechanism will result in disease in patients and how we will recognize and treat them